Hello and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Today it's just me, Aaron, here. Just want to give a quick intro. Um, this is going to be the last episode of our coverage of Murph 2019. These will be the interviews that Joe did on Sunday. I hope you're looking forward to hearing it. Uh, but quick, you might notice the episode numbers are all different now. We recently just got all of our episodes up on YouTube. So if you're interested, in, go check it out. Or if you're already listening to it on YouTube, here you are. So that's why this episode is now number 34. If you have any questions about the interview topics or anything regarding Murph or our coverage of it or about the people we interviewed, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our official Twitter handle is at MakersOnTap. Uh, if you want to reach out to me personally, my handle is at Aaron Makes. Uh, and with that, uh, enjoy the interviews. All right. So this is the first Murph interview for Makers on Tap. Who, who, who am I interviewing? Uh, my name is Tim Hatch. And Tim is one of my favorite people because two years ago at Murph, he completely saved my ass in the midst of my giant rocket 3D print. We were trying to figure out how to get a fan onto this thing and crimp these pins, and I had the worst crimpers ever for crimping DuPont pins. I, I think it's also relevant that you had a drilled out volcano nozzle at the time, and so you were trying to extrude at what? Two uh, millimeters or something? Two millimeters in a standard E3D volcano. And started a print before it had any sort of cooling fan on it. There was no cooling fan with PLA, and the printer had also never printed, and there was also no bed leveling because it had a two millimeter first layer. <laughs> And Justin's over there crying, laughing, because he, he can't believe the ridiculousness. <laughs> oh, God. But it worked. That's the thing. It worked, thanks to Tim. So Joe had gotten out some kind of, like, $10 crimper on Amazon. Yeah, like, like some weird eBay crimpers that we found. I don't know. And I noticed he was having trouble getting the pins to stay on. I ran and got my favorite crimper, which is an eBay find in itself of which I had never found another. I brought it over with two hands, and I think he Facebook Live the whole thing. It was just the most beautiful process. It, they hold the pens, they accept the wire, they, they crimp in the most wonderful way. And it turned out Tim knew so much about crimping. So much, I had no idea that crimping was such a science. <laughs> there were different types and like, I explain. <laughs> so, uh, I have many crimpers. I, I scour eBay for obscure crimpers and try them out on things to see if they happen to match because many of the connectors that are popular have either really expensive crimpers or there isn't an official crimper that fits them in the case of the clone DuPont pins. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we were dealing with at the time. So, the crimper I have that works well on those had some markings on it, but I didn't know where it was from or what pins it was even intended to go with. It says on it CDM, and there's a CDM in the US that makes, I don't know, aerospace things. But I tried contacting them and they said they don't do crimpers. It's not them. And so about a year and a half later, I was still looking into it, and I found there's a company CDM in Canada. I emailed them, and it turns out they do sell crimpers with the partial part number I have on a crimper, which looks like it's from the 90s. Yeah. Uh, they were able to look up in their current catalog what it is and tell me what it goes with. It's a Multimate Roman numeral 3 series. They were also willing to sell me one after a bit of effort <laughs> because I wasn't a company. They made me get a postal money order and mail it to them. Yeah. And so a few weeks later, uh, I have a modern version of this now, which I've just handed to Joe, so he can now make good DuPont crimps. It's, this is so meaningful because I have a tool changer standing next to me and rolls of DuPont pens just waiting to be connectorized <laughs> so that I can change out my tools on the tool changer. And the, my tool changer's print is failing, but I don't, I don't care, whatever. It's printed with so many good things this weekend. <laughs> but I, I, 
Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It, it's now going to go in back in the bin that contains only DuPont pins. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, and Tim has this glorious bin just full of connectors and different number sockets and yes. And I am starting that bin actually. Do you have a bin per connector series yet? Not yet. Okay. Someday. It, it'll come. It, it, it will come. It's a disease. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much, Tim. Sure. Great talking with you. <laughs> okay. Addendum to the Tim interview. He just told me about this guy on the internet, and his name is Matt, Kripper Matt. Uh, yeah, he's got a last name, but if you Google, like, Matt that cares about crimpers. He <laughs> has a very long web page that goes through different styles of crimpers. And among the things that he mentions is the quest to find a good DuPont crimper. And he actually details with the historical genuine DuPont pins, which were bought by uh, Berg, and then I think Berg was bought by Amp. He actually located some of these pins from probably the late 80s which are the ones that people really mean when they say DuPont pins. Right, right. But modern DuPont pins have been cloned a few times, and they are now different dimensions than the originals were 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, because everybody has a standard, and that's the best thing. Right. So <laughs> They're all different. <laughs> I managed to find a few of these pins on eBay, and they are indeed longer by a smidge. And I managed to find the crimper that Matt suggests. It does not work well on modern DuPont pins. Matt has yet to find this CDM crimper, and Joe, I think we need to tell him about it. Yes. W yes. What we should do is email him this podcast and be like, you have to listen to this specific time signature so uh, you can know. You can know the wonderfulness of, the, of, Matt, uh, uh, of Tim's crimpers. So I'm going to read off the part number from the historic one. Matt, um, Joe, can you grab your current model one? And we'll read that one off as yes. well. Yep, yep, yep. So, All right, so go ahead. Uh, since we don't have the visual to go with this, um, the crimper I'm holding is black. It is matte black with um, some, what is it, plastic dip type grips. Yeah, yeah. It is cycle controlled, so you have to press it all the way yeah. before it opens on you. And it has three um, lands, I guess, on the die. They are labeled in colors and in square millimeters cross-sectional area. Yeah. And the red one, they are red, blue, and yellow. The red one is suitable for KK as well as DuPont. Okay. It, I have not used the other two, and I don't know what they fit. Perfect. It, you, it's just like my other pair of crimpers that I've never used the other two sections of either. So, <laughs> yeah, I get it. Uh, so the older part number is 769116-0. And the new part number is only slightly different, but it's enough to trip up Google. Okay. And it is, is it this WT number? No. Oh, it's part number is 769-116-00. Uh, the first dash is actually a dot. Dot. You want, you want to re-record that? I've been, making, I've been makers on tapping and drinking a lot of dink meme. It's 769.116-00. It, it, the only real like difference uh, is open it up. The handles are actually slightly different. Are they? Uh, as well as mine is already broken in. They are. They are different. So the modern one handle is actually very similar to the handles you find on the red Molex crimpers yeah. of of the same cycle controlled nature. Yeah, they're they're plastic and they're flanged. Now, I'll post a picture of this in the show notes so that you guys can see them. Here, do this. And mine has a Toughcon logo, where yours has a CDM logo. That's really the main difference in the, the physical looks. Well, let's compare the cycle control. So this is my old one. Here's the new one. 
So I have to do like two squeezes to get the disconnect. Yeah. So they just need they need a little love. They need to print clip crimp a lot of pens, which they're about to do. It's their bright future. Yes. All right. Thanks for doing the addendum, Tim. This no is really good. In this interview, Chris and I sit down with Andy Cohen from 3D Printing Today. It was super fun to sit down with another podcaster that talks about 3D printing because we've never got to do that before. So check out this interview, and we'll be back with another one. This will be fun. All right. So this is Joe with Makers on Tap. And Chris. I'm Andy Cohen with 3D Printing Today. Whitney's not here. Um, we're at Murph. And we're going to do something that uh, I know I've never done before. We haven't either. So, so this, this, could, this could be weird. <laughs> this may work well. I'm sure it will. But we're simulcasting on both our podcasts. Yeah. So, so did you have a good show? Because we're coming to the end right now, the, in the afternoon on Sunday. Uh, yes. I am, uh, as Murph ends every year, I kind of hit my, like, my show depression and I'm like, oh, I'm leaving my friends, and I'm oh. leaving my wonderfulness. Oh, man. And, uh, and then, you know, on the way home tonight, I'm just going to start planning for Murph 2020, and it'll be fine. So it, this year was wonderful. Yeah. How about you? This was my first show. Oh, man. I'm, I'm from Northern California, so coming here is not easy to do. I retired last summer. Okay. And now I put all my time to my, my, my old 3D printing clients and my podcast and having fun at Makerspaces. Awesome. Um, and so this was my first show to, to Murph, and I came here originally, this, I figured this is a one-time thing. <laughs> you know, I'm going to come to this, I'm going to check it out, I'll have a great time, but I'm not going to turn this into a, a yearly thing like I did for CES for 15 years. Okay. No more of that. Well, n- no, <laughs> I'm coming back next year, you know. So give me your first time, Murph experience. Well, keep in mind that this year is twice as many people as last year. Yes. This year's Friday it's, Friday night was as big as Saturday night last year. Yeah, and that was the biggest heard. one ever. Yeah. It, this was insane. Mike's my, my my opinion and what I saw is um this is by far a vo- I I'm, we used to do shows out of like big big money exhibit kind of things like CES all over the Bay Area. Yeah. And we also used to do the Maker Fair yeah. in San Mateo. This is by far way ahead of, of any other show I've been to for focusing on open source desktop 3D printing. Um, if you like to 3D print in your home, this is really the place it, to it, come to. Th- this is your mecca. Yeah. It, yeah. Like, it, 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 it's funny because it's in the middle of nowhere in Goshen, Indiana. And um, a couple of episodes ago, uh, we did uh, we did, we interviewed John, and we talked about why. And it, it's it's because it's a pilgrimage. You come here because you want to be. Yeah, here. if you're going to come to Goshen, the fact that you're going someplace where there's really not much to do means that you are dedicated. So it's like a filter. Yeah, it's a filter. It's like if you're kind of on the fence. Like, well, we can go there and then go to the beach. <laughs> Not the same thing. Yeah. Not the same thing. So we were thinking I'd come out here as a one-time thing and figure out their secret sauce and bring it back to California. And I'm not so sure it's possible. I, I would totally go to Worf. So <laughs> Worf, or we, call it, we could call it Bay Area Rep Rap Festival. Yeah. I, barf. I mean, it, it, barf. 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 Yeah. Barf. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, if you make it, I will come. Um, <laughs> let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, we're up in wine country, so you know this time you could bring a spouse and they could go do something. And my spouse would not be able to do anything here, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and, and I'm getting the phone calls. When are you coming home? And kind of stuff. Never. This yeah. is amazing. So we're gonna try. We're gonna try to do it. We'll start it really slow at a makerspace, and try to do it the way they did it. Try to get some uh, YouTubers to come. We'll be podcasting there. Yeah. We'll give it a shot. See what happens. So, for three years, we did our own uh, Rep Rep Fest in Peoria uh, the day before Murph in an effort to catch the people making the pilgrimage on the way. And uh, we did okay. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. always really fun. 
it, it was mostly my way of getting all of the people in central Illinois that were coming here in one place the night before and make sure everyone had their stuff done. Yeah. I never had my stuff done, but it was it was a good effort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so so how many times have you come? I this is my uh, this is my sixth. This is the seventh huh. year. I came I started coming the second year of Rep Rap Fest. Wow. I've been missing out. Wow. Yes. It's an experience. It really is. Like, yeah. it's, it's a whole thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, so let's compare notes. If you were to judge the most interesting exhibit, commercial or maker, oh boy. who would you put up as the most interesting, innovative, interesting kind of the thing that makes you, will, will make you remember Murph 2019? Hands down, I know What? What? Yours is gonna be the speakers. Oh, the speakers. <laughs> There's okay, so that's really hard. Um, let me let me categorize it. Not it, not <laughs> not the lecturer speakers, some stereo speakers. Right? The stereo yeah. speakers. Yeah. Um, so there's. There's a guy in uh, the other hall that has been doing audio design, and we we just we clicked immediately. We have similar backgrounds. We started out in car audio, and like and his speakers are beautiful, and, and I can't wait to uh, work on those. But then there's also from like somebody pushing the bounds with simplicity. There is uh, the PTP uh, printer guy that is doing full color. Uh, the lithopane. lithopane. Yeah, that's yeah. that's Jason Bruce. Yes. Yes. Oh, Isn't that, that amazing? Amazing. Yeah. And then the uh, the printer that blew me away, the printer design that blew me away the most, was uh, there's a guy who built a very functional uh, printer bot, Big E-esque printer from a wire rack shelf. I didn't see this. Where it, is that? Uh, it's down at the end of this row yeah. on the on the left side, and it works beautifully. And, huh. and similar to the belt printer design, he made it to make swords, so he can make a six foot long printer for like twenty dollars. Wow! And, and everything is carried on the carriage, and it, it prints really, really I did, well. I did see this. I do remember now. Yeah, yeah he's got the swords on the table. Yeah, yeah I remember. And I looked at it and I thought. What is that? I'm gonna go back and look again. Yeah, yeah. So how about you? Okay, so I'm gonna start with the thing that impressed me the most technically. Okay. Um, I would say it's the Tech Child uh, Tool Changer 3D printer that's in the right next to the Snowblow. Is that what they are? Yeah, Snow Labs. And right, and right, and and next to Ryan Carlisle's book. Yeah. Um, that printer. It's it's a really really big. Core XY with direct drive extruders. Yes, his, that, his that direct drives me. are really nice looking. Yeah, yeah. I want them bad. Yeah, I'm <laughs> when I get my tool changer, I'm only going to get two extruders so that I have two spaces for his extruders. Yeah, for sure. So that that impressed me the most as far as what I might want to buy. Yeah. Um, I think what impressed me the most um, in terms of maker was the Mendel based, fully 3D printed printer in the other building. The only thing that's on there that he bought that's metal are the screws, the hot end, the stepper motors, the power supply, and the controller board. Literally everything else is 3D printed and it works really nice, including the belts. Yeah, yeah he even the prints belts. the belts. Yeah, yeah. wow. Did, uh, did you look at his 3D printed linear motion mechanisms? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's how he started. Yeah. Little ball bearings and he made the casings for the ball bearings. He integrates the rails into yes. the actual printer. Very impressive. He even prints Very the balls. Impressive. No. Yeah. He, he prints the balls? Yeah. Oh, they, my he's gosh. He's got some that have, like, real balls in them. But he yeah. he also, he's got ones that he printed the balls, and wow. they work they work almost as good. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the most impressive of, of what people have been making here. And a close second is Jason Bruce and the color lithophane. But, yes. you know, if I said that, I'd be biased because he's a good friend that I talk to all the time okay. on, yeah. on our boards. So. His stuff's beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, one, one thing that's definitely showing in this conference, and see if you guys agree, is two things. Um, the, 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 the growing dominance for the 32-bit controller board seems to be going to the duet. Mm -hmm. And the others are seemingly not represented here, which indicates to me that the community is not buying them. Yeah, um, I, think, uh, I think with like the Redeem controllers and, and those, 
Um, you know, all of those developers, they have other jobs too, so they're they're not doing the work quite as fast as like Tony and the Duet guys. Um, so there's that. They still make phenomenal controllers, um, but we've been waiting on uh, the Redeem 2 controller for like two years now. Wow. And then Smoothie V2 has been like a six year wait. That's so, at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, it's a hard thing. I yeah, don't, I don't. I don't know. So duets seemingly in the lead, and now the 32-bit board to go to. I know I'm going to be buying one to upgrade my Clone R1. Yeah. Just to get familiar with the firmware, get familiar with the connectors and everything, and then it, I'll, I see having one with the the tool changer as well. It, you know, it's a road to to do it because before my tool changer, all I'd ever used was Marlin, but you know, to be able to update my my tool drop-off positions and everything on the fly, to be able to update my wipe sequences and my firmware retracts on the fly while my printer's running. That's that, pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And the other thing is how responsive David, Crocker, and Tony are. Like, as we're developing the tool changer, they're like, oh man, we, we have these issues. Okay, we'll get them done. They'll be done in the next firmware release yeah. in like a week. Yeah, yeah that makes and, a difference. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. So, and now we're seeing uh, other firmware developers joining in on the RepRep firmware project. And so there's going to be some cross-pollination there. In like, yeah. I, yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It, this whole world, I love it so much. Like, competitors are, are sticking together. And, like, we can make everything better by working together and cross-pollinating ideas. Yeah, we can make more podcast material this way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the other thing that I, that I noticed in this show is like this is the year for railcore. Yes. There there's rail cores everywhere. Everywhere. There's the designers are here, the producer of the of the parts the part suppliers here. Yeah. There's two vendors that do aluminum upgrades here and they're all over the place and I I'd say that that's probably the dominant yeah. core XY machine right now. It, it it's a fantastic design. Yeah. Um and uh, it's probably going to be adapted in the relatively near future for tool changing. So it's... Okay, now I'm gonna do a sleeper, a sleeper one on you. Okay. This is one that I, th I think everybody just walked right by. Okay. I walked right by, okay? Because when you look at it, the first glance, you think, ah, CR10 clone, All right? Okay. You say, ah, it's just another Mendel, metal Mendel from China, meh. Meh, who cares? And then I took a look at it because the guy I was talking with pointed to it and told me about it. Okay, well, first of all, it's not just an ordinary Mendel Chinese clone. Okay. It's a massive, super over-engineered Mendel clone that's at probably the limit you would want to scale up with that style printer, but they scale up everything. The, it's a larger stepper, it's sliders, but that's not the thing that makes it interesting. It's an IDEX. Where's this at? Uh, it's straight back this way in the middle. Okay. He's got three printers there. Um, in the middle, is it's the T-Rex 3. Okay. Two carriages, ov way over-engineered. Oh, is it tiny machines? Yes, it? tiny okay, machines, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a massive build area. And the thing that makes it really like, oh my gosh, is if you buy the biggest model, it's $1,700. Yeah. Have you ever costed a Sigma? Yeah. That's 4000 Yeah. So you can get an IDEX printer for 1700 and it's not a piece of junk. It's really well engineered. Yeah. I didn't know he had one in person. I need to go look at that. Yeah, that was the sleeper. From, from the show, that I, awesome. as far as I could tell. So, Well, this has been really great. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, I, I think I said more, I, more than I sh probably should have. I should <laughs> let you talk more. Oh, that, we talk a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tell me about your podcast. So uh, we're Makers on Tap. We are a podcast of, done by Makerspace directors. And we drink and talk about making stuff. And... We talk about the strife of the creative process and um, dealing with non-creatives as creatives. And uh, we like to bring um, creator-based businesses on and talk to the people who who built them and like, what drove you to do this? What's your passions? What's keeping you going? 
uh, not necessarily about your business, but just like keeping you going as a maker. It's a different show than ours. Yeah. We're different. We're not in com competition with you. We're uh, pure technical, dig deep, uh, deep dive into whatever related to 3D printing and 3D capture. Okay. So my, my partner, Whitney, who unfortunately is not here, he's a wizard on photogrammetry. Nice. He, and I'm the one that does all the scanning with the white light scanner. Okay. Um, and we he makes his own machines and I mess up my machines and fix them. And we like to build machines and talk about them in detail. We get a 3D printer, we don't just put it together and do a quick video. We don't do any video. Instead, we put it, we talk about putting it together, talk about unboxing it, we talk about putting it together, we talk about getting it to run, fixing it, tuning it, breaking it, fixing it, tuning it, breaking yeah. it. We buy it ourselves, so if it stinks, we tell you that it stinks. Um, and if it's awesome, we keep talking about it. Yeah. Basically. Awesome. So that's, that's our show. We've been doing it now about five years. Oh, wow. About 280 episodes at this point. Um, and we're at a point now, it's studio quality in, in, my, in my office, uh, music, segues, we try to make it as, 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 as approachable as possible, nice. as we say in wine country. Nice. So. And we've been doing this for about six months, and oh. we're just really happy no that we're I still never doing it. You. you started. <laughs> yeah. We're How just, often? How often? Is it weekly? Weekly. Yeah, we're weekly also. Yeah. We're yeah. just happy that we're still going. None of us ever thought that this would still be a thing. So Cool. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was awesome. Yeah. So this is Joe with Makers on Tap, and I'm here with... Carl of Knack 3D Designs. And what did you bring to Murph? What is this? this? This is the White Knight belt printer. Which we have talked about extensively over the last couple of weeks uh, that we're super excited about. So what makes the White Knight special? What makes the White Knight special? Uh, 400 by 430 build volume by uh, infinity. By, by infinity. Ah. Yes. yes. As we've joked the whole time, the possibilities are, limit, are literally endless. Oh, man. All the puns. Oh, I love yeah. it. They, they, they keep on coming, trust me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad. So the other really cool thing about this is this is really one of the first completely open source belt printer designs. Correct. It, it, purposely open source. Purposely open source. I, I hope it stays that way. I, there, I've had lots of people asking me questions this weekend. Aren't you worried about Stratus's patents? Aren't you worried about possible black belt patents? I said, for, they can't tell me I can't build the printer, yes. patent regardless, because I developed it myself on my own. Now, whether they'll ever come down and say cease and assist and take your files down, I don't know. I don't think they'll even do that. But the minute anybody tries to make a kit, we'll really find out what happens. Yeah. And, you know, once you release it on the Internet, there's no stopping it. Exactly. That's the best part so of the Internet. People copied it. It'll get moved. It'll get republished. We um, already have the files, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things that boggles my mind about your design for this is the design software you used. And you successfully built something. You, you designed this in 3D Builder from That's Microsoft? Correct. That's correct. I mean, I did start off with somebody else's original DBot files. Okay. And th there's a few remnants in there somewhere, uh, especially right around where the pulleys are for the belts. They made those little nipples in there that support the bearing just perfect. Yeah, yeah. But that's about all that's really left of it from their original design. I, I, I cut, and I sliced, I stretched, I skewed just about everything except where those bearings mount up because that was I needed that for the spacing for the 2040 they already done the hard part for me okay and then uh, I yeah everything else I kind of just added subtracted and see and, and that's what's amazing about this culture of like rep rap and and makers in general is like you did that because that was the, the software you had and the software you knew and you created something wonderful without these crazy fancy five thousand dollar softwares and um, you know all the tools that people act like you have to have to do something this complex. Like, this is a very complex machine assembly. It, it's, good uh, job. <laughs> I, I, I won't lie though. I would 
I, I, I know I need to learn Fusion because I do not look forward to editing and improving the design in Microsoft 3D Builder even one little bit. Anybody who's ever used it knows exactly how hard it will be if someone tells me I need to relocate one of the, any hole in this thing by any distance whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to digging in and, and helping with the fusion conversion thing. It, this this will be a fun machine to to re-engineer into a fusion design and, and yeah, yeah, be part of. I, I, I look forward to getting somebody's notification saying, hey, yes, uh, we've redone all your files. They're now step files. Now you need to learn fusion. I'm looking forward to it and yet scared at the same time because then I'll have absolutely no choice but to sit down and force myself to learn fusion. And I'm just going to, my reply back to everybody would be, okay, I'm learning fusion. Do not ask me anything to be done for at least a month till I figure this out, you know. So it, going off of this, this is such a really cool machine, but what I really want to know is like, what was the project that inspired you to even start this? What was the big thing that pushed you to like make this design? Um, it's pretty much everything Midnight Giant makes. The, the whole point was, and I'm going to hand you the mic for just a moment to grab something. Th this massive sword I'm holding here, it was given to me by Midnight Giant at Earth last year. And I held it up to the light and I realized you can see all six or seven pieces this thing is made of in the metal pins that hold it together. It and I said, How, what are you printing this on? He's like, I'm doing it on a CME CNC, you know, Artemis. Oh, nice. And I'm like, how much infill's in that? Uh, probably 15, 20%, something like that. And it's got some weight to it for what it is. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you could print that in like one or two pieces? How would I do that? Well, you'd need either a really tall printer or the logic is to do a belt. And we would had been looking at the uh, printer belt yeah. at Earth thinking, that's nowhere near big enough, but maybe we can buy one of those and just make bigger pieces for it and mm -hmm. make it work. And then we all know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say, I have the design files in Fusion 360 for the printer belt. They appeared on Twitter one day right after the demise, randomly. Yeah. Well, it, and I have the archive. So if you ever want to see it, if you want to look through it. I don't think I want to go back. Cause <laughs> Bill, Bill Steele came here and looked at, my, looked at what I did. He said, you did it right. Just keep improving what you got here. Yeah. Don't look at anybody else's because you've Clearly, you know what you got going. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I spent probably five minutes looking at black, pictures of the black belt. I spent five, ten minutes looking at the printer belt at Earth last year. And then I shut down all my internet windows and I brought up 3D Builder and pulled the DBot files that I had for a 500 by 500 DBot I was building and said, okay, now how do I turn this on a 45 degree angle? And that's where everything went from there. Nice. So it's a 45 degree angle that yes. you're using? Okay. I, I think the black belt was like a 37 and a half degree. Yeah. And if you go on their version of Cura, you can go any, they've got like 30, 40, 45. Okay. It, there's a couple different versions. I don't know if, I know there was at one point I remember seeing a year or two ago when I first looked at a black belt that uh, they originally had a design where you could change how many degrees it was. Yeah. Now it looks like they're all fixed, but they still list different degrees in their software. So I'm thinking you can probably, I think now they ask what you're trying to manufacture. Okay. Since they sell just for commercial manufacturing, and they go, oh, well, then 30 degree is going to work best for you. And I think they probably yeah. sell it that way. I don't I don't know for sure because I've never been able to afford to even consider buying one. So. Yeah. Well, then Bill has a plug-in, a post-processor plug-in for like Simplify where you, right. just, you run your code in and you say, you know, my gantry is at 37 degrees or 45 degrees. So there's software solutions. Yes. So you're using the Black Belt Cure for this I am one, using though? Black Belt Cure just because from what Bill's told me and what I've seen, no one else is really doing belt printing. So no one's really doing anything with the software. The plugins haven't changed since they were created. But Black Belt is constantly updating with the versions of Cure and adding features and support capability. And I'm like... It works. They're they're constantly improving it. Why would and it's free. Yeah. Why wouldn't I continue to use an, a constantly improved product that's free? And I am definitely not a programmer. I don't think I could write it any better. Right. The only, the only reason I could ever see to use any of the other the plugin for anything else is if okay, you have people like Filament Frenzy that are just gods with Simplify 3D. He's gonna want to run that plugin on Simplify 3D and write profiles for it with Simplify 3D instead of Cura and. That may at some point convince me to go that direction because 
I know nobody can make a better profile than Filament Frenzy right now, and I really hope he builds one of these and makes me some really good profiles for it. Yeah, yeah. I, I would like him to do it with Courage, just because it's what I've always used and I like. But I can tell you that if 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 we go forward with the, what we talked about last night and do tool changing on this, we're probably going to have to move away from Kira because the scripting is at least something to be desired. But we have Pathio coming. Yes. And Pathio is. I haven't touched Pathio yet, but. Well, I, I've it, always been a firm believer. You always wait for like version two or version three. But I, I, I'm, I'm not a beta tester. I, I like after they've had a chance to fix their bugs. Yeah. Like every time Apple releases, here's you know, iOS 11. I wait two weeks because you always know iOS 11 0.1 will be out two weeks after they send that out. Yep. See, I'm I'm on the other side. I'm I'm an alpha guy, and I like calling people and be like, hey, this doesn't work for me. You need to fix this for me. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I never thought about it like that. And then you get input. That's the so. one thing I have liked about it is, is a, there's a plus and a minus to building a printer that all of a sudden everybody decides is the next greatest thing. Mm -hmm. I'm getting tons of attention, which, OK, I can barely talk today. That's definitely the downside. The positive side is I've had to cut, especially cut those nozzles for this thing so they'll clear the belt. When, the, when E3D walks down and the first word Sanjay says to you is, we're going to make a nozzle you won't have to cut on your lathe. I'm like, okay, I get to, I'm, I'm realizing I actually get to ask manufacturers for things now. I'm like, ooh, I can ask for custom made stuff now. Yes. <laughs> well, man, let us give you back to the crowd. So are you going to be at Earth this year? Definitely. It's only 30 minutes from my house. All right. That, well, that's home event. We'll there see you, you at Earth this year. All right. All right, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This is White Knight, and you're on Twitter? I'm on Twitter as Knack3D Designs. Okay. YouTube is Knack3D Designs. Even Thingiverse is Knack3D Designs. And it's N-A-K-3-D Designs. Yeah. So. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right. So this is Joe again, Murph, and I am here with, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm uh, Matt Gordon. I'm the, the founder of Printed Solid and now the uh, owner of MakerBox and community member. Awesome. Um, and they, So you guys had a pretty big announcement uh, two days ago, I guess. We did. Yeah. We did. So I'm no longer with Ma Printed Solid. I've sold it to my business partner, David. So David's going to do great things with it. And um, yeah, I'm going to be running MakerBox as basically as sort of my maker project and kind of returning to normal life and, <laughs> and doing this as a hobby. So congratulations. Look, looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. It has awesome building printed solid and, and doing that and having all the engagement with everybody. But yeah, looking forward to normal life. Seeing, seeing your family again. Exactly. Doing, doing the things that yeah. I, I, I told Matt and Dave both separately. Congratulations and condolences for what you're about. <laughs> like, it, Printed Solid has been such a great company. You guys have uh, been such a solid supplier of so many really good things. Yeah. Um, I, I like that you guys were one of the stores that like, I knew if I was buying it from you, it wasn't gonna suck. Right. Like, yeah, we worked hard for that. That was it, and I mean, it's been from a business perspective that's been that's been good and bad because i am extremely selective yeah um dave's going to continue to be selective but a little bit less extreme so there okay. should be more variety introduced um you know my perspective on carrying things was like it's not going to suck wasn't a high enough bar it was like this needs to be really really good yeah um you know dave's perspective dave's gonna broaden and there will be more things that are that are great for you know we'll, we'll you know, in the last four months, we've expanded our parts offering for people that are building their own printers, things like that, yeah. that, that might um, might be harder to use for some less knowledgeable people, but great for the makers. So I think, you know, that's going to be good stuff because that's, I mean, Dave is much more, much more down into the guts of a maker than I am. And I think that's going to be great for people. Yeah, I, I love following Dave on social media and seeing all of his posts of him inside machines. Yep. They, that's what that's a good CEO. The guy yeah. that's willing to climb down into the grease and fix things and be a part of the business. Yeah, we uh, often have to tell him to like wash his hands and wash his face before he <laughs> talks to customers. <laughs> um, so Dave's background it was lasers. Is it going to branch out into laser stuff at all? 
Probably not. Okay. Probably not because of that background. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things with lasers is they, <laughs> they catch fire. They do. Um, so as a business, there's some liability there. So yeah. I, I, I think we maybe offer more cutting services for people, but I don't see us selling lasers. Okay. Unless it was like high-end machines, and I don't think that's where we want to play. I think we, yeah. I mean, he's a maker. He wants to work with makers. Well, it, and it's good that there's companies that are getting back into selling the parts for ref wraps again yeah like, there was that lull and it got kind of hard to buy stuff for a little yeah. while and now we're starting to see people dive back into the really weird machines like with the white knight belt printer and the tool changers and they everyone's kind of getting back into that like complexity passion yeah and i'm really excited to see that this year yeah uh, we, we've had our our run with the chinese printers the pre-built stuff and everyone's back to like you know, we could really make this better if we yeah. do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And yeah, I think this this Murph in particular, I, w what's been striking to me is, you know, usually Murph, it's kind of a mix of machines air printing, machines being worked on. Here it's like everyone's just got their shit together, you know? Yeah. Everyone's just printing and all kinds even of crazy machines. Even, yeah. even you, <laughs> printing and talking. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it's it's awesome. And it's so much creativity and innovation and different machines. It's yeah. awesome to be part of. So tell me a little bit about MakerBox and what your plans are for that in the coming future. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, MakerBox is a, is a filament subscription sampling box. So um, it's you get four 16-meter samples of filament. My The premise there is it's... It's for people who see all these new materials coming out and say, man, I wish I could try all of those, but I don't have the money to buy all those filaments every month. Yeah. And, and probably 75% of them are things that I'm not ever going to print anything other than one thing to say, oh, that was cool. And I'll. So yeah. now with MakerBox, you have a service where you can try all those weird filaments. And that is my passion, is nice. finding those weird filaments. So we have you know, featured a lot of really odd stuff in the box. And, and that's, you know, I'm just going to continue pushing on that. Um, one of the things that we've done poorly as a business is sort of communicate what we've done historically. So there's nowhere you can go other than like, like if you watch the Fun King uh, YouTube channel, yeah. it's there, but there's no MakerBox owned site where you can go and say, what was featured in, you know, July of 2017? Okay. Nowhere. So it's actually a quite a, you know, we've been going since April of 2016, four filaments a month. So there's a pretty large body of work to be done, but we're going to build up that library and what the print settings were and where you can go to buy them. Oh, nice. So a, a good resource page. So I'm going to be working on that. Um, what's the, what's your favorite weird filament that you featured in the maker? Box? Um, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> So the, um, I mean, the Owens Corning uh, GF30 polypropylene was a really interesting one. You got that to print? Say, okay. well, so we have you, different perspectives it, on favorite here. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, my favorite was, you know, from that perspective is like, wow, you know, being able to have something like this and get this into people's hands. That stuff is incredible if you can get a print it to is. finish. And so what I find is, you know, getting it just onto... Uh, packing tape. It's fine. It's just you have always have packing tape on the other end of it. Yeah, my problem with it has been the packing tape peels up yeah. when, it, when it warps. This is the stuff that I printed my uh, DJI Osmo Pocket that you were over. Oh, yeah. That stuff that I was fighting. Oh, yeah, and so I've done a lot. I've done a lot of small stuff out of it, okay. so it might be you know my perspective is there. And if you've done larger, denser parts, maybe it hasn't been. Um, I mean, we've we've featured tons of metal fills. Like I think. Uh, the protopasta magnetic iron. That, oh, that one's cool. I, I like a lot of the protopasta materials, actually. So the magnetic iron, I, uh, their, their glitter flake that we featured, that was one that was surprising how much I liked it because yeah. I'm an engineer, and that's a, just a pretty material, but I really like it. Um, what was the other one? A Unico fill, a company in Germany. They have a rainbow filament that changes the full rainbow every 16 meters. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of the, you see, like, the Strong Hero and, and those companies, and it's, like, 200 grams before it changes, which you really have to print big things. Yeah. With this, you could print relatively small things and see the change. Yeah, I, I was talking to Louise about that, and, like, she's like, you really have to print things with a lot of infill to get a good gradient if yeah. you want to. So. Yeah, and then, you know, brands that we've found that we've ended up bringing on board for printed solid. So, like, the Polyalchemy Elixir. That was a MakerBox brand. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, it's used everywhere. Um, and uh, not quite as popular, but still been pretty good as, like, the Steelman's Matte Forge PLA. That's just been pretty well liked. Okay. Awesome. 
Was there anything you want to add? Uh, I don't know. I mean, thanks to everyone in the community that supported us. And this event, you always leave with like this high of yes. like how awesome this really is. It's just such a great reminder. Yeah, this, this year especially has been an, uh, a great re-energizer for my efforts in, good. in all of this. So. Good, good. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time, Matt. I yeah, know thanks. you guys are super busy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is Chris back at Murph again, uh, and I am here with... My name's Amy Dansby, Amy, Amy Double D, whatever you want to call me. So. Awesome. And I just wanted to talk to you for a minute about your awesome Vanellope cosplay yesterday. It okay. looked incredible. Um, what kind Thanks. of work went into it? Lots of curse words. <laughs> Lots <laughs> of curse enough. words. Um, so there's an artist that makes these like concepts art. So from Wreck-It Ralph, there's a character called Vanellope. In the game, she just wears like a... Or in the, movie I guess she wears like a sweatshirt and a skirt well he makes these concept art so you can make like full like armor so I was like all right this is a 3d printing event I like cosplay stuff I'm going to 3d print my entire suit of armor I don't I, <laughs> that sounds it punishing seemed, it seemed very like fine and logical at the time but right. I don't know everyone makes like all these amazing little intricate things for like I don't know, everything 3D printing, it's amazing, but like to make something for yourself that you have to wear is always like, I think of a few things when you make like cosplay stuff is like you have an escape plan, like how yep. to get in and out of what you're having to wear, if you're gonna have somebody help you like put it on and if it's heavy. Yeah. So like I printed everything with a 0% infill, but Smart. I didn't sand anything. I kind of, I was like, this is a 3D printing event. I'll let the filament lines show and everyone will at least appreciate so I have like, I get the maker box. So I have all my filaments. I'm yeah. like, I'll just use samples for like all these candies. I use like 30 filaments. Wow. And okay. I didn't paint or sand a single thing. Was, I don't know. No, that's awesome. Not everything like worked the first time, but it went really well. The I have these little gumdrop candies and I use Fusion 360 to design them. And then I generated a, a Python script to yeah. randomly generate the textures on the surface model. Oh, so you custom did like even that. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. I always try to like push myself a little bit to like do something a little different. And I've been wanting to play with the Python scripts in Fusion for yeah. a while. So pretty neat. No, that's amazing. Yeah. Like, wow. OK. Fun. What, it, what has been some of the other stuff that you've done in the maker community that has like you've really been proud of? Um, quite a bit with electronics. And then I also started a scholarship for Girls in STEM through the National Video Game Museum. So um, oh, we'll, it's kind of been a strange little thing because it's supposed to be everything involved in STEM specifically, right? Yeah. So um, we'll teach workshops for like learn to soldering or... Uh, or more advanced stuff or like just simple robotics but I always try to apply something that they're doing to something that's of interest because you could teach some kid or a teenager or an adult it doesn't matter like how to solder or how to work with electronics or how to program but until you apply it to something that you're interested in it's a completely different aspect so yeah. we teach these kids like how to do soldering how to make you know, an LED turn on, which is like super simple. You don't even really need soldering. Right. And, um, but then you apply it to like a 3D printed sword and then they're like, like, they're like, oh, this is freaking awesome. You mean this is what I can use this for? Right. So you kind of just need like that gateway drug of like, this is what you can do. I don't know. It's kind of well, how it, I feel. It's, it's finding that hook. It's finding that thing of like, what, where do you want to get into it? It's like that. I think a lot of us all got into 3D printing because we wanted to make a specific thing. And then once we saw the possibilities in it, we were like, oh, yeah, no, I want to print everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like uh, I used to work in manufacturing. So we had access to, like, all the industrial printers and stuff I probably never even appreciated until, like, you know, we started to, like, make, like, swords and stuff on these, like, really nice, you know, $250,000 printers. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And then I buy my first printer and I'm like, what the, the quality is not the same as this, you know, crazy <laughs> printer, but I don't know, it's like the night before when you're like sanding stuff, you're like, why do I do this to stuff? Why do I do this to myself? But I find that the community for the 3D printing is, at least from my experience, it's been mostly very, very positive. Yeah. Especially like Twitter, like if you have a problem and you can post it, like people are very, it's like, oh, I've had this happen, try this, or I'm probably like most of everyone here, we all have day walker jobs. And you probably work for some company where you can't talk about what you work on. You can't talk about your code or something with NDA. Yeah. So this community is very, 
I know you find something in like keep sharing, I guess. Sharing is caring, some cheesy thing like that. It's yeah, it's so cool. Like so the Facebook communities, the Google Plus communities, like even though that's going down and it sucks, but yeah. it's like it's such it's so much of a like welcoming and helping community that it's yeah. like it's incredible to be a Plus part of. Plus I said of. generally for the most part like people are asking questions because they don't know or they don't like they need help. And the fun thing is somebody else has probably already had that problem. Yep. Though I will say um, my Vanellope core set, like the core set was made from flexible TPU from Filamentum. And I asked them, I was like, oh, how is this for like being on the skin? Is it going to be breathable? And they're like, what do you mean on the skin? Like I use it for un unintended purpose, but uh, they told me not. So I put like fabric under it, but Fair enough. I don't know. I'm just like. This is flexible. I want everything in this costume to be, but I got to move around. Yeah. Though I couldn't sit, so that was like kind of a. <laughs> what have you enjoyed most about Murph this year? Uh, looking at everybody's booth. So that's kind of why I don't like to have like a booth. I want to walk around and look, but just like I stopped and was talking to this guy. So you walk over by his booth and you just see you're like that's cool. But when you stop and talk to him and like learn what he actually did to go like put into something, and you're like, oh that like. That's really interesting. That's how you like learn and improve on like so many new skills or whatever. I don't know. Absolutely. I love that. I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, thank you so much for sitting yeah. down with us. Uh, where can people find you again? On the internet. It's <laughs> under Amy Double D. My webpage is Amy DD. My name's Amy Dansby. You can Google me on. So I don't know. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, we'll make sure to tag you. Thank you okay. so much again. Yay. And have a fantastic rest of the festival. Thanks. All right, so uh, this is Joe again, and I am here with Greg and Sam and Rory from E3D. Hello. How's it going, Hi. guys? Hello. And um, <laughs> this, this, is, this is like two days into Murph, and we're all kind of burnt, but I really wanted to catch these guys because these are some of the minds behind some of my favorite E3D products. Um, everybody knows I'm a fanboy, um, but like you guys are the ones running the projects to do the incredible things. Uh, Greg has been the head of the tool changer? Yeah, tool changer for the last, well, since its inception. Yeah. Two years now, I think. Long yeah. time, yeah, it's been a long time. And uh, it, it's it's just been a, a phenomenal machine. It's been super fun to collaborate with, with you and like give feedback and do all of that. Yep. And um, tell us a little bit about the changes for the production machine. So we've added in belt tensioning to the front of the frame, which is something that beta testers requested. Uh, we've got yeah, you did. belt pulleys on uh, both sides. Uh, I didn't notice that. Yeah. So they, they, they should retrofit onto the beta machines as well. So you should Perfect. be able to just tap in a couple of holes and bolt them on. Nice. Uh, we've also added belt clamps. Obviously, you can't see them because the, the face plates are on there, but we've got proper belt clamps in there. OK. Uh, we, I like how we're starting with the smaller stuff. Well, yeah. You've got to build up to the good I'll, stuff. I'll you know. It's all right. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Uh, yeah, the belt clamps, uh, and then of course the next thing in the, the small stack is the stepper motor. So we've gone away from a servo because the servo was burning out. Yeah. Sixty thousand tool changes, and it was a couple of the MOSFETs on the servo. Yeah. Uh, this current stepper motor has gone through maybe approaching three hundred thousand tool changes now, uh, and it's still going strong. And, and that seems like a huge number until you take into account that like a normal print could be 3,000 tool yeah, changes. Yeah, we, we we're, we're basing it off of an average of about 3,000 tool changes per yeah. print, which is only like 100 mils, you know, an, an average print size. Yeah, yeah. the goblet I printed had 2,600 tool changes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's incredible that we're even doing that many, and it really puts it into perspective the uh, robustness that needs to be designed in. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was something that we wanted to make sure it didn't fail midway through a print that you've been spending like a two days running and it servo stops picking up stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the next big one is the carbon fiber. Oh uh, yeah, the carbon fiber arm. Unfortunately, we, we're having to swap out the carbon fiber bar uh, purely on a thermal expansion problem. It's so a delta between the, the numbers on the aluminium and, sorry, the carbon fiber and the, the rail is, is large, so we get quite a big deflection on it. Uh, Rory's probably better at explaining the numbers <laughs> than I am. Uh, yeah, so it's actually not that bad. So it seems like a bit of a downgrade to go to aluminium, but um, all the money we've taken out by going to aluminium, we've uh, put back in. If you look at the underside of it, obviously the podcast, you can't. Um, yeah, we'll we've post pictures. It, yeah, we've uh, hogged it all out, so it's very much skeletalized. And so it's like 27 grams heavier than the carbon one, uh, but the torsional stiffness is three times as much. 
So um, although we're having problems with CPE, um, and that being the main reason we went for the change, uh, it's actually better than the carbon bar in terms of its performance. Okay. And um, yeah, so five percent on the moving mass, um, but. 3x for how stiff it is, so it's it's not a downgrade by any means. No, and, and the moving mass, I, I think, is is sort of inconsequential. Like, if yeah. we want these insane accelerations and stuff, that's fine. But it, at the same time, like, are you really ever printing at 300 millimeters per second? If you're not Renee, yeah, well, <laughs> you're going to run into melt flow problems with that. Yes. Piece. Unless you put on sound super volcano, yes, which is more than possible. Uh, what's the, the biggest tracks you've been printing with that, Sam? Uh, so we were pushing out with a 1.4 mil nozzle. We were doing three millimeter wide tracks and at the same time, 1.5 mil high. Um, so that yeah, that's like six times the normal track width and like five times the normal height. So yeah, it's, it's pretty insane. That's bigger than I've ever tried with my super volcanoes. Well, I, I, yeah, I went, how big's the nozzle flat? It's going that big. Yes. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was good fun. <laughs> We're gonna get to the point where we need like a post wiper to just follow the track behind and flatten it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's good fun. Um, what would you guys think of Murph this year? Big, hectic, lots of people, lots of exciting stuff. It felt a lot more fresh and alive this year. It seems to have picked up and yeah. uh, invigorating is probably a good word, I think. Yeah, it's good fun, good fun. You're not the first person to say that. Everyone seems like uh, they feel like the RepRap community has really been reinvigorated yeah, yeah. with like, the, the, the new, more complex mechanical innovations that we're bringing back into this. So it's really, really exciting. Yeah, there's, there's not just our tool changer here. There's been other ones. We've seen uh, Joshua's one with the cable drive system. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of them out there. Did so, you see the one uh, that the guys from Russia did that has uh, the bearings yes, for their, bearings their tool the pickers? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that He's was... He's done that with his kids, hasn't he? So it's really, yeah. really good, that one, yeah. So. yeah. All right, guys. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, this is really fun to have you guys on. Thank you. Anything you guys want to add? No, I think it's been good. It's been a good show. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. So this is Joe again with Makers on Tap, and I'm here with uh, Jason Pruce. And um, Jason, what did you bring? Uh, so, so sort of my uh, showpiece this year is uh, color lithophane. So what I've done is I, on, uh, I've taken yellow, magenta, cyan, and white, and by altering those colors in different layers, I can get a uh, kind of a full spectrum uh, color, and then I have a lithophane on top of it, and uh, so, it, so it's a yeah, color lithophane. And he's all shredding, shrugging, like this is no big deal. <laughs> it's like it wouldn't be a hard thing to do. It, it, We'll post pictures. They're, they're hard to describe by, by words, but it is a full color picture made with four colors from an FDM printer. It, that's it, and it's single extrusion. It, that's just insane. Yeah, I, I am. It was sort of when I had the idea. I had a picture of how well it worked, and it, this is way better than I had anticipated. I, I thought I could, oh, I could get a little shading or something like that, but. This, this was much better than I thought it was going to be, which is kind of rare in 3D printing. It's usually the other way. You have grand ideas, and you go, uh. uh. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And then you have these these baskets that are, like, woven. Like, right. Well, uh, my wife does uh, real basket weaving. Okay. And uh, so you know, having all these baskets around the house, it kind of gets in your uh, into your mind. And so I thought, well, there's, there's like, baskets on Thingiverse that, they're, it looks like you took a basket and maybe scanned it, mm -hmm. and then you printed it, but it, they're not, like, woven, truly yeah. woven. So, first of all, since I have a, a mosaic palette, I can do different colors, but I also can do, um, using Simplify 3D, you can do uh, different processes. So, what, what that means is I can print the rods and the, at, all at once and then print the weave. So, it really okay. is weaving... The, the filament around those rods. And it does it one layer at a time. Yeah. Um, but it is it is actually woven. That it's And it gives it a really nice look. Yeah. It, it looks different than you would if you just had printed a, a, like a scan of it. Yeah, they're they're very aesthetically beautiful and you you can they it really looks like it's bent around right. the the reeds. Mm -hmm. They're incredible. So um how did you go about the the lithopain process? Like, I, I realize it's probably very complex. Like, g give me the ten thousand mile view. Right. <laughs> so, um, so at first, um, so I'm printing five layers of color. So there's only so many combinations of those. So I, I literally print, do a print where I have every single one of those combinations and little swatches. Okay. And then I take a picture of it, 
and then you can uh, you know you can load pictures on the internet and do like color pickers. Mm -hmm. So on each square, I click, oh, what's the hex code for this color and this color, this color. So then I uh, go into GIMP and I load the photo that I want to turn into the lithophane, and then I convert it into just those colors that I have. Okay. Um, and then I export it, and then I have a script that then takes, okay, this pixel is this color, and now I have my recipe over here, and then it creates the, um, okay, so pixel one, layer one's yellow, layer two is yellow, layer three sign, so on and so forth. And then from there, I have OpenSCAD actually create those uh, STL files to, uh, you to use, so then it's only really four STL files in the end. You use OpenSCAD? Yes, I use OpenSCAD. Believe it or not, I'm one of the you know five people left. That, it, that Aaron would on. be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it's really useful because it, it's a you know I, I have in this lithophane there are 384,000 individual 0 0.8 by 0 0.8 squ millimeter squares okay. that you have to choose whether it's yellow, cyan, magenta, or white. And so OpenSCAD, I can do a huge loop, and it'll then go through and then create those, you know, merge them all together. It takes hours for it to do, but, oh, wow. you know, the computer's doing the work, so yeah. what do I care, right? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I use OpenSCAD actually a lot for things. That's awesome. I, I, I keep telling Aaron that, the, that like, OpenSCAD's going to be good for art, and the, there are just things that you could never do a, in a modeling software and, uh -huh. and c are able to be done programmatically. So right. that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, this stuff's absolutely beautiful. Uh, um, do you have anything you want to add? Um, where can uh, people find your stuff? Um, pretty much, uh, well, on th I do have, uh, on Thingiverse, my handle is JMP, just those three letters. And I do post um, a fair amount of my, my, uh, my stuff there. I am on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Pattern to Print, and the the two, the two is T O. It's spelled out. Um, that's I do have a YouTube channel, but I don't I don't I don't publish much. It's just a, it's just a time thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to follow kind of what I'm currently doing, um, Twitter is the best place. And then if you want to see what I've modeled, you know, if you want to print it yourself, you yeah. go to go to Thingiverse. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is Joe again at Murph. And now I have Michael Hackney. And Michael, who are you? <laughs> if I were me? Yeah, if you were you, who are you? Uh, I'm just some guy, you know? <laughs> Michael's just some guy, you know? <laughs> so Michael's the Slicer Whisperer. Um, I have and been called the Slicer Whisperer. I've been called a lot of other things. It's hard to put a label on me because I'm um, a very eclectic individual. In fact, one of my companies, uh, Eclectic Angler, is uh, focused on fly fishing and publishing books in the fly fishing arena, and that's one part of my life. Um, and I've been involved in 3D printing for a little over 12 years now. Um, and uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the 3D printing world, I'm known as Sublime Layers. Um, that's my blog. I have a YouTube channel that I talk about the art and uh, science of 3D printing. And, yeah. and to me, it really is more than just the technology. There's an art to it. So yeah. in the, the things that I design and produce, um, I try to make them as beautiful as, as I possibly can, as incorporated into the design, and also embracing what I call the grain of 3D printing and make that part of my, my design aesthetic. Yeah. It, Michael is somebody I've looked up to for years. I had the opportunity. Because I'm tall? <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> like, I'm an average height guy. I'm six feet. Michael towers over me. Um, but I had the opportunity to like hang out with you at E3D's booth, kind of by oh, happenstance, yes. at Earth, East Coast yeah. Rap, Rap Fest. And then um, this year we've been... Uh, subject to many beta tests right, together. Right. We just keep ending up in the same places. And um, uh, so we fought through the E3 tool changer together. Yes. And uh, I, I, that has been a, a, a fight of passion and uh, uh, hatred sometimes, but also <laughs> like it, it, it's been so much fun. I've learned so much from him. And then the, most recently, the Prusa beta yes. for the SL1. Yep, that's right over there. Yep. And I, I like how you didn't print with yours either and just left the bed and stuck it. <laughs> right. Well, you know, the challenge with the resin printers is the odor of the resin. And, yeah. you know, in, an or, in, a, in a room like this, you got to be careful about that. People could be allergic to some of these resins, too, and I don't want to yeah. kill anybody. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want anyone that's sensitized to come by right. and then suddenly have an issue. Um, so 
And then one of your other things that you've been doing, what, what, what is, what's, the, what's this? <laughs> yeah, so I also am an author and a publisher of books. Um, I started my first publishing company about 12 years ago in, uh, for fly fishing books, okay. um, Real Lines Press. I've got seven authors. I've published um, 14 books now. Um, I've authored my first book that I self-published, and that's got me into the publishing business. And learned a lot about you know sort of niche public publishing okay. uh, for markets that don't have you know millions of uh, of potential readers, but it's important to get the information out. Yeah. So as I've been uh, getting more and more active in the 3D printing communities um, and blogging a lot, I've you know collected a lot of information that I want to get out there. So I started writing a book that hopefully will come out in June and July on the art and science of 3D printing. Awesome. And so I started putting a position. Sublime uh, Publications as my press for doing that. And then um, last year I met Ryan Carlisle, and Ryan is well known in the open source 3D printing community, um, very active in a lot of forums, Google uh, groups and things, and he's uh, been collecting information on 3D printer design and really the mechanics of 3D printing, and he's a stepper motor genius, and um, has been working on a book, and was looking for a publisher and we got introduced to each other and took a look at his book and I was blown away with uh, the quality of the content and the depth of the information. Awesome. The thing was, it was like a thousand pages. Oh, <laughs> you God. can't make a book that big. <laughs> yeah. So we decided to divide it into three volumes and the first volume is uh, 3D printer engineering and it's about the motion uh, platform. So, okay. uh, you know, the frame, uh, treating uh, all different kinds of printers, from Delta printers to Cartesian bed slingers to Core XYs to the Hang printer to a lot of other odd things. In fact, I learned a lot about printers that I didn't even know about from uh, editing the book. Oh, wow. Yeah. Awesome. So that's available now, and then the next uh, volume will come out later this year, and then probably the third volume early in 2020. Awesome. So uh, what, what's been your favorite thing of Murph this year? Um, that's a great question. I guess, well, from a personal perspective, my greatest thing that I enjoy is when my followers come over to me and uh, you know, say, you're Michael Hackney, the Sublime Layers guy. And I'm like, yeah, that's me. Um, I really enjoy meeting people that have stories that I've helped them yeah. over the years. Um, that's one big thing. And then from a technology side, um, actually, this is kind of a plug for my friend Roy, but uh, Roy's son, uh, who I drove here from Boston with, is a really bright guy, and he has developed a direct drive extruder um, that is very light. It has dual drive gears. Um, in fact, he's using the Bontech gears for it, um, and it really is a, an amazing piece of engineering. Yeah. So that's one of the really cool things I've seen uh, that I didn't know about before. I mean, the Prus SL1 is really cool too, but I had one, so I knew about that. And yeah. the tool changer is a really cool thing, but I have one of those too. Yeah. Yeah, it, you're not the first person on the podcast to mention Roy's extruders. Yeah, which yeah. is really kind of cool that like he's getting so I'm much attention. I'm fortunate that I have one on my Delta over there, and I have two more I'm putting on the uh, tool changer, and I'll get two more so I have the tool changer completely outfitted with it. Yeah, I'm 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 hoping to talk him into let, yeah. getting me some. Yeah, well, so. we're good friends, and he he's at my house almost <laughs> every weekend doing something in my with my printers or in my shop. I have a machine shop, so I'll help them with making parts and stuff. And Excellent. Yeah. Well, it's been awesome to talk to you. Awesome um, talking to you, as usual. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'll see you on the, the slacks. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, that was Michael Hackney. Thanks, guys. All right, this is Joe and Hi. Murph again. And I finally have somebody I've been trying to get on the podcast since the day we decided to do this. <laughs> what better place to do that than at Murph? Yes. This is Claudio Donlet. I, I can't say your last name. I'm not even going to try. I usually wait for the awkward pause. I'm like, <laughs> yes, that's me. How can I help you? <laughs> and we're here in the Lulzbot booth? Yes. And it, what, did you, what did you bring? So this is a Lulzbot Taz Pro. Um, it takes everything that's great about the Lulzbot line series, um, adds in a little bit more with the Lulzbot legacy, and now we have a heavy-duty, reliable, professional printer. Um, a few notable improvements. Obviously, we're going to be shipping with the dual extruder standard. Yes. Um, we're using two linear actuators to deploy the active tool head. Um, They're two, two arrow extruders yes, now. Yes, yes. Um, we do have hardened steel components within it. 
So you're printing with carbon fiber, glass reinforced, uh, glass reinforced nylon, all the fancy, strong, industrial strength materials that traditionally you wouldn't be able to use without redoing a lot of your printer. Yeah. Um, you would think that having two moving um, extruder and hot end assemblies would be kind of awkward and annoying. Yeah. Um, that kind of implies you're going to have to do a lot of manual calibration and all this other stuff. We've taken that out the same way we've done our auto bed leveling. So now we have a CNC style calibration block where we're actually doing X, Y, and Z axis offsets for each hot end. Yeah. So those 12 variables that we've introduced are now automatically measured, noted, saved in the firmware, and compensated for throughout the print. Yes. And because we're doing that, we're also able to do backlash detection and compensation. Um, so once we have contact, we then count how, off, how many more steps it takes to come off, save that value, store it, utilize that throughout the print, so now you have more precise prints without a lot of work. And that is awesome. Yes, and because we're fully committed to open source hardware and free software, all those changes in Marlin 2 are being pushed back to the community, so mm -hmm. that if you want to add that to your printer, uh, drill a hole in your bed plate, connect some wires, throw a screw in there, add in those values, and now you can do the same kind of offset so calibration this, as well. So this is running Marlin 2? Yes, Marlin 2. Oh, uh, that's we're exciting. We're doing that on the Arkham 2 board with the updated Trinamic stepper drivers. Um, Nice. It's proven to be fun. Uh, UI changes, we have a color touchscreen. Um, that's being driven by an open source hardware board that's running free software as well. Okay. Um, so you, sh you should be able to add that touchscreen with that board okay. to anything that's running Marlin. So think Rambos, um, INCs, yeah. those kind of thing. Oh, man. Um, yeah, kind of fun. So many cool possibilities. Yes. Um, we've added a filament runout sensor. Uh, that also does, well, obviously run out and yeah. uh, strip out detection. Uh, we're doing that with a small uh, open source hardware daughter board that we've also designed. Um, it's using a magnetic encoder okay. to pick up flow rates and things like that. It, the, the grind detection, that's, that's huge. Yeah. Run out detection's been easy. We've been able to do that for a long time. Yeah, but, like, but grind detection, has that's been something we've needed. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to be using a PLA blend with clay or some other really, really light, fluffy materials, you're able to adjust the trigger points so that if you're looking for, say, you should have moved two millimeters within this point, um, you're able to just change that on the LCD oh, and nice. continue on with your day. Dude, that's, that's huge, because like, even with my tool changer, trying to get my chalice to print, you know, my, my main filament yeah. ended up grinding, and so oh. then I had three millimeters of two different colors just hanging out above the rest of the cup. And you know that's so frustrating. So, yes. uh, and my runout sensors didn't catch it because gotcha. they, they're not catching, they're not doing movement detection. Yeah. So, so and by using a mechanical system, you're able to do that with translucence. You're able to do that with uh, a ton of different classes of materials. Oh yeah, yeah. So, a little bit about Claudio. Right, row. Claudio is one of my favorite people, and has been for years. Claudio and I met at. Uh, my first Murph, yes. like six years ago. Yes, indeed. And uh, you know, every year I just look forward to coming back and getting to hang out with my friends. Yes. In head tilt. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's just so great to see you. Yes. Um, awesome. I look forward to this event every single year. Yeah. So, do you have anything you want to add? At some point, I'm making my way to the uh, Peoria Maker Fair. Oh. I've it's heard Maker great Fest. things. Maker Fest. I've heard great things about it. It's the second weekend of August. Awesome. I mean, <laughs> you, you just you just should. It's, yes. Yeah. You just should. I'll come pick you up from the train station. Okay. I will let the family up there. <laughs> awesome. Yes. All right, man. Thanks, Claudio. But of course. Thank you. Thanks, Lilsbot. Yes. And we'll see you next year at Murph. Yes. Yes.